Citrix licensing, and configuring farm settings. In the last nugget, we talked about how to install Presentation Server onto our system. There, we also installed the license server onto our Presentation Server. In this section, we're actually going to install the licenses into that license server. The first step in this is we need to go to the mycitrix.com website. This website is where we'll punch in the information we get from our value-added reseller when we purchase our licenses. We'll get from there a license file that we'll download and add using the license management console that's installed on the presentation server itself. This is the process that needs to happen every time you purchase additional concurrent user licenses for your presentation server. Then, once we get to the licensing component, we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about configuring the farm settings. First, we're going to start by showing you what the MetaFrame toolbar is and the items on the MetaFrame toolbar, what they're used for. And then we're going to talk about the Citrix MetaFrame console, or the CMC for short. The CMC is where you do most of your configuration for your presentation server. There are two sections of the CMC, really. There's farm settings for the configuring uh, settings for the entire farm and all the servers in the farm, and then individual server settings. In a lot of cases, some of these are the same, and we'll talk about when is a good time for you to configure settings at the farm level, and when is it a good time for you to configure settings at, for each individual server. For the CCA, you're going to have to know a lot of what these settings are, what they mean, where they're located at inside of the CMC, and what they do. So this is really important. In our previous section, we talked about installing Citrix Presentation Server into our server. Now we've actually got to get it licensed so that our users can take advantage of it. As you'll notice here, as the, after the server reboots, once the installation is complete, we get notified that the server is still not licensed. We didn't license it during the installation. And so we're going to get this error message, this Citrix license error, pop up from time to time. Now, you know, it's funny, different applications have all kinds of different ways of licensing. Some of them require the licensing when you do the installation. Some of them won't even boot unless you complete the licensing. MetaFrame gives you a conven convenient um, uh, license error reminder every five minutes or so that lets you know that you haven't completed your licensing. Note, if you leave the server up without licensing it for a period of time, you may have to click this more than once. You may actually have to click it 10 or 15 or 25 times. But at least now you know. OK. So we've logged into our server. When we purchase our Citrix licenses, we're probably going to get a license string, perhaps a number of them, but at least one. This is a license string that uh, we're going to use for this evaluation. Note that you won't be able to use this on your own. But for our purposes, let's use this as our license string. Citrix has a website called mycitrix.com. And at this website is where we're going to enter in this license string and activate it for use with our license server. I'm going to log in with my logon ID. And after logging in, I'm going to choose the Citrix activation system. And activate licenses. It's here I need to paste in my license code. And like any good company, Citrix keeps metrics on where you purchase your licenses from. Here they refer to it as a solution advisor. You want to punch in the country and state of your value-added reseller and also their name and click search. You'll be able to search for them. Here I'm just going to choose not that I cannot find my reseller. In the next screen, I get the option to choose the contact for these licenses. In this case, it's me. I click Submit. This screen asks me to uh, make sure I put in the license server name for the license server that's going to host these files. It's very important. This license server is case sensitive. So if my license server name actually has uppercase characters, I'm going to need to include them here. The host name of this license server is the same as the initial Citrix server that we installed in the previous section. If I open a command prompt and type host name, I'll see that this is an all lowercase ctx nugget one.
You see that my evaluation is a Citrix presentation server, 90-day evaluation for 99 licenses. And I choose Allocate. And click again to confirm. I now have the ability to download the license file. Now, Citrix's license program is sort of based off of an application called FlexLM. It's a, it's a proprietary version of FlexLM, but it's the same construct. So if you're familiar with using FlexLM as a license manager, this is going to be relatively simple to you. I'm going to click the link to download the file, which comes in a .lic format, and save it to my desktop. It's a really small file. Note that at any point in time, you can always come back to the My Citrix License page and grab that license file again. I can open this file if I want. It's just a text file. And you'll notice if I open it up in Notepad, it includes the host name of my license server in, in the top line of the file. There's some additional information here as well as a key that uniquely identifies the file. To install the file, I'm going to use the Citrix License Console. I open that up by clicking on Start, navigating to Citrix, Management Consoles, and clicking on the License Management Console. This is a web-based console. So again, if you're used to FlexLM, this is a lot easier than FlexLM. Here, in addition to being able to install additional license files, I can view current usage data. I can generate historical reports on what my license usage is. It's some very nice graphs that I can create that'll show me how, during what times of the day my licenses are being used, what percentage is being used at any point in time. To add additional licenses to the server, I click this Configure License Server node. We've already done step one, which is download the license file from mycitrix.com. Now we need to copy the license file to this license server. Browse for the file and click the upload button. And I've noted here that the copy is complete. So that's really all there is. Back in the old days, back in the uh, Metaframe XP days, we had user connection licenses, we had user Unix integration services licenses, we had server licenses, we had all kinds of licenses. A lot of those have been consolidated down to the single license file. If I click this link for the complete license inventory, it'll actually show me what my complete license inventory is in this server. If you're used to the old days when we had to go and, and uh, do activation keys and write down 25 or 30 different 25-digit uh, strings. That's in, the, that's in the past. We've now completed licensing for our presentation server. So let's move on from all this licensing hoo-ha and move on to configuring our farm settings. I'm going to delete this license off the desktop since it's now no longer necessary. And I'm going to show you, first of all, the Citrix ICA toolbar. The ICA toolbar which is here under Administration Tools, is this nice little toolbar that appears for administrators on the right-hand side of the screen. It is here which you can access all of your MetaFrame configuration tools. ICA Client Update Configuration, which is where you update your clients. The Shadow Taskbar, which allows you to configure how you enable shadowing to your users. The Citrix Connection Configuration Tool, which handles the ICA connections themselves and how those are locked down. The Speed Screen Latency Reduction Manager, which configures the speed screen and how that is uh, how speed screen is enabled for users on very low latency or high latency connections. The ICA Client Distribution Wizard for creating client distribution packages. The SSL Relay Configuration Tool for configuring SSL Relay for encrypting traffic. The Presentation Server Console, which is your main uh, configuration tool for the presentation server and the Access Suite console for your for the other components of Citrix like Web Interface and the Secure Gateway and the Access Gateway. And then down here is just documentation. For this section, the tool we're going to be most concerned with is the Presentation Server console. Let's click that now. A lot of times this is uh, short to just the CMC, the Citrix MetaFrame console. I'm going to punch in my password here, my username and password as the administrator on the server.
And you notice here for the farm that we created in the last section, this is Nugget Farm, in this area is where we will configure all of the settings for our presentation server. Before we dig too deep though, it's important to notice the difference between farm settings and server settings. If I right click on Nugget Farm, I can choose properties and view the properties of the farm itself. And this is all the servers that comprise the farm, the Nugget Farm. If I want to view properties of each individual server, I'd click on the plus sign next to servers. And you'll see that I can right click here and choose properties again. And these are the properties of the individual servers. Now this is important to note because we're going to talk first about farm settings. And in some cases, you're going to want to set the farm settings in a particular way and then configure each individual server to just default to whatever the specific farm setting is. Let's view properties there now. So let's go through each of these settings one by one and we'll talk about what each one of these do and how they configure your MetaFrame server. This first one, connection access control. This allows you to define how users can get into your farm. Now, if you have a web interface server configured, you probably want to force users to come in through that web interface server. Same thing through Program Neighborhood Agent or the MSAM. You can also force connections to come through only the MSAM version 4 and later. And this is important because you may not want your users to be able to directly connect to your MetaFrame server. Back in the old days, we didn't have this ability, and so users could bypass web interface and all of the, uh, the security lockdowns that we've configured through web interface or the Program Neighborhood Agent and go straight to my Citrix servers and get uh, access to published desktops. If I'm not interested in allowing them to do that, I need to reset this. In my case, I'm going to set it to any connection. For connection limits, I have the ability to limit the number of times that a user can connect to a MetaFrame server, to any MetaFrame server in the farm, in fact. If I select this box, I can set the maximum amount of different published applications or published desktops that a user can, can, can attach to at the same time. I can also enforce that limit on administrators if I want to get particularly draconian. This isn't if I'm really conscious about the licenses that I have. If I, if I don't have enough licenses to go around, I may want to limit the number of connections that any particular user can have so they're not connecting too many times. Now note that if a user connects multiple times to the same MetaFrame server, they will only consume one license for all those connections. But if they're connecting to multiple servers, they can use multiple licenses. ICA Keep Alive's is when, you're, when a user is connecting to the server over a latent connection, or really any connection, ICA Keep Alive's are a little ping, if you will, that occurs from server to client that keeps the connection alive, that keeps the, the network tunnel alive when the user is not doing something. So if the user is working on there, they're merrily working away on their Citrix session, and then they leave to go to lunch, and they, uh, the, the network gear, the network equipment between the server and the client says, wait a minute, there's no traffic going on between this client and the server. Obviously this connection is closed. Well, it's going to close down the connection and you're going to lose, uh, the user is going to lose their connection to the Citrix server. What the ICA Keep Alive does is it says, okay, every so often I'm going to send a little ping from the server to the client to say, hey, keep this tunnel alive. Don't allow it to collapse. This is a major, uh, this is a very important thing to do because this is a, a major problem with uh, some initial Citrix installations with these keep um causing clients to disconnect from servers. Recommend keep enabling keep alives and setting them to the default timeout value. In the next section, we configure ICA settings. Under ICA display, we see discard redundant graphics operations and an alternate caching method. Generally, you want to see, leave these two checked. This is uh, in, involved with really tuning the ICA protocol so that it is as small as possible. If you've got same, the same graphics appearing again and again inside an ICA stream, it's going to discard the redundant ones. And also use something called SuperCache, which is a, a, an improved caching method left over from previous versions of MetaFrame. We can choose how we want to uh, degrade our, uh, our sessions when we have networking issues. Do we want to degrade color depth first or resolution first? And do we want to notify the user? This auto client reconnect is very important because at times our clients have problems actually connecting to the server. They may disconnect for a second because of some transient network connections. And when that happens, we want to ensure whether or not, or we want us to enable whether or not they, the reconnect requires user authentication, or do we want to log those automatic disconnects and reconnects? 
you probably want to log those connects if you, if you or those reconnects if you have concerns that your clients are disconnecting a lot so you can see when and why those clients are reconnecting and the next note information it just gives you some basic information about your server and your current session count the number of servers in the farm how many published resources you have and the zone information we'll talk about the zones a little bit later the next note is the the sort of master toggle switch for uh, application isolation environments uh, isolation environments are a little out of scope for this particular session, but really it's the concept of taking applications that would be installed on your Citrix server and putting them in an isolation bubble so they can't conflict with other applications on your server. The next note, we have license server information. We notice here that we have this, the license server specified and the default port number of 27,000. Next, we discussed memory and CPU utilization management. In situations where your user load or your resource use is higher than the resources you have on hand, you may want to enable memory optimization or CPU utilization management. Memory optimization is the rebasing of DLLs on a system. When you've got a lot of users that are using a lot of applications on a system, anytime they make use of a DLL on a system, they create a copy of it in RAM. And so you end up with this ballooning effect of DLLs inside your system. This en enables a process by which those DLLs are compressed and RAM is, is uh, reclaimed. Here in CPU utilization management, if you have a lot of people on a system and one particular user causes a processor spike, CPU utilization management says, okay, well, no one, every user on your system has a, an equal slice of processor time. And so if any particular user uses more than their available slice, they really can't affect the other users on the system. Probably a good idea to implement if you have a problem with CPU spikes. We talked about memory optimization. This is the interval and time when that memory optimization occurs and the applications to ex exclude. Some applications don't support this process by which Citrix reclaims available memory. This is, if you do, in, if you do install memory optimization, make sure you test your applications thoroughly before enabling it for those applications. Here in our MetaFrame settings, we talk about how data collectors and RAS servers respond to client broadcast messages. We also talk about how the clients handle the time zone information. The Citrix client, especially the newer versions of the Citrix client, have the ability to sh display on the screen of the client the local time zone for the client and not the server. Imagine this. If my server is sitting in the mountain time zone and my client is sitting in the eastern time zone, without this, when my client would log into my server, they'd see the wrong time in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. What this says is, don't use the, the time zone of the server, use the time zone of the client whenever clients connect. Or I can disable that local time zone estimation. Uh, I'm going to skip past uh, XML service DNS address resolution. This is uh, whether or not you want to allow DNS resolution on the XML service. If you're a Novell directory services shop, this is the preferred tree. Client redirection we'll talk about shortly. Uh, that has to do with the, that essentially is the master toggle for allowing client redirection from server to client. This item here, and enable remote connections to the console. Using RDP or ICA, you can actually create, the, an administrator can create a connection directly to the server's console. This is something new with Windows 2003. By disabling this checkbox, you are not allowing the administrators to connect directly to the console, and instead they would have to use an ICA session or an RDP session to connect to the server. This last one here enables multiple shadowers. If you're a user that is shadowing another user, you can merge your shadow session with another user in multiple shadowing policies. Session reliability is also something new that came with Citrix Presentation Server 4. Um, and it's sort of a classic case study. Think of a guy sitting on a train somewhere and he's wirelessly connected in to a Citrix server and he's typing away, he's getting his work done. And while he's typing away getting his work done, the train goes into a tunnel. If that train goes into a tunnel, he's probably going to lose his wireless connection. Well, without session reliability, that connection would probably close. The user would no longer see the connection. They'd disappear. He'd get all upset because he was working on his project. They'd try to reconnect and it was sort of a pain in the neck. With session reliability enabled, that session remains up and available for a period of time, in this case 180 seconds, while that period of network problems can, can work its way out. Perhaps the train exits the tunnel or, or network conditions return. Note that if you do enable session reliability, that's going to change your TCP port number 
for MetaFrame, the, the default port number for MetaFrame is 1494. If you enable session reliability, that encapsulates that 1494 traffic into TCP 2598, although that is configurable. In this next section, I can enable SNMP agent on the servers. This is handy because I can enable it directly on all servers all at once. I can enable speed screen browser acceleration, which um, provides the perception to users on high latency connections where there's a lot of time between when the traffic has to move from the server to the client and back. This uh, gives the user the perception that it's faster than it really is. That's why it's called speed screen. It compresses JPEG images to improve bandwidth. You can also uh, use it for flash acceleration to optimize flash uh, animations and for multimedia as well. What this does is buffer up a number of seconds of uh, multimedia onto the client. Test these if you implement them. These next three have to do with virtual IP addresses and virtual loopback configuration. There are some applications that have a hard-coded restriction such that the client has to be at a particular IP address for the application to function. I think these are some, some, old, some older applications, some, um, some highly proprietary applications. This is a new feature that says, okay, if this application requires a particular IP address for a client or a range of IP addresses, I can add in those virtual IP addresses here. These are the processes that require those virtual IP addresses. In the same vein with these virtual loopback addresses, which is down here. These are the processes associated with those virtual loopback, and these are the uh, uh, servers for which lo lo virtual loopback is configured. If you have an application that requires an IP address or a particular IP address for it to function, you're going to know it. That's just the way virtual IP addresses work, and, and these particular applications are well known for being problem applications. And that brings us to the concept of zones. We sort of glossed over zones at this point during this, pre, uh, this section and also in the, uh, the installation section, but I think now is a really good time to talk about why zones are important and why you may need them. You'll see here that I have a zone configured uh, for 192.168 and that the server CTX Nugget 1 is in this zone. Now why are zones important? I think the, the, most, the easiest way to explain it to you is with the picture to explain why zones are important. Right now I have a single Citrix server, right? That Citrix server is currently connected to a database. That database is the data store. Inside of the data store is stored static type information, information that doesn't change very often. Also on this Citrix server, because it's the first server in my environment, is the data collector. And the data collector is a process which collects dynamic information about my Citrix server, like session information, like uh, uh, load information, how many users are on the system, how much resources are being used, like published application information. Anything that's considered really dynamic is kept on the data collector. Now, if I have one Citrix server, this is pretty easy. I've got a single Citrix server, I've got a single data store, I've got a single data collector. But as my number of Citrix servers increases, I probably don't want to replicate this highly dynamic information across multiple Citrix servers. I probably only want to have a single location where this dynamic information is kept. That's the data collector. The data collector actually handles this um, the storage of data for a particular zone. So if I identify a zone as a particular subnet of systems, let's say 192.168.0, any systems that are in the 192.168.0 subnet will appear inside of that particular zone. I don't have to name them after, after subnets, but it's a good location because typically subnets are geographically based. Let's take this one step further. It's kind of hard to see if I have three servers, so what if I have 300 servers? Let's say out here in California I've got 300 servers sitting around. 
I've got users that are connecting into those servers. And I've got one system that is the data collector for that zone. If I've got another set of Citrix servers off here in New York, this is San Francisco, this is New York, if I've got another set of 300 Citrix servers that are here in New York, I probably don't want to have to replicate that highly dynamic data across the wire. And so I create another zone for New York separate from my San Francisco zone. Generally, these zones are areas of high network connectivity. So let's go back to the configuration screen. You'll see here I have a zone that this server is involved in. I could create a new zone, for example, and I wouldn't necessarily have to name it after the subnet, but I could. I could call it New York. And in the New York zone, I could add additional servers. You'll see here it's a question mark because I don't have any servers involved with it. This is sort of difficult to show with a single Citrix server. So let me go ahead and fade the screen here. And when the screen comes back from the fade, you'll notice another second Citrix server in my environment. Let's pretend like that Citrix server is the Citrix server in New York, while my CTX Nugget 1 server is in San Francisco. Okay, so whoosh, we have our second Citrix server. Don't you wish building Citrix servers was that easy? Just a little whoosh. But uh, seriously, though, so we have two Citrix servers here in this zone, and the New York zone still has nothing in it. For me to move this Citrix server into the new zone, I actually have to click this Move Servers tab. And I'm going to get an error message here that says, Warning, you need to reboot each server that you move between zones. And that's because the, 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 the data collector for each zone is going to need to get additional information, and, and a reboot is going to be required to do that. So be aware of that with, when you plan on moving servers between zones. So if I want to move CTX Nugget 2 to the new target zone, I click CTX Nugget 2. I select the target zone down here and I hit OK. And now you'll notice that I have my original zone, which actually I should rename to San Francisco, and my new zone, which is New York. The other thing you'll notice here is this check mark. This check mark has to do with elections. Now, you remember back to your basic windows uh, for browser elections for the Browse Master service? Uh, all the servers or all the workstations that are sitting on a particular subnet have a little election where, where each server tallies up its votes and the server with the most number of votes gets to be the browse master. Well, it's sort of the same here in Citrix. Um, however, you can, um, you can rig the election if you like. For this particular server, I can set the election preference to, in this case, most preferred. If I want that server to be most preferred as the server, to be the data collector, I can choose this box. I can also choose high, more preferred, default preference, or not preferred at all if I don't wish it to be. The reason why I might want a particular server to be a data collector as opposed to not is because the data collector process actually consumes resources on the server. If I have 500 systems in my zone, I'm probably going to have a data collector that's doing a lot of work. And as the number of systems in my zone increases, I'm going to move towards more and more resource use for the data collector function. In fact, it's recommended that as you get to a very large number of servers within a zone, that you actually create a presentation server that does nothing but handle data collection. It doesn't actually, it's a presentation server, but it doesn't actually have any users on it. In that case, all the other systems in that zone may be considered as not preferred, and the one that is the dedicated data collector will be chosen as most preferred. Right now, for CTX Nugget 2, I don't have any election preference on it, and so it's set as the default. There has to be one system in each zone as the data collector, so I'll just choose them both for most preferred. Down here in the bottom, we talk about zone data collectors enumerating program neighborhood. That's, that uh, is the determination as to whether the data collectors only are the ones that enumerate program neighborhood or if each individual server will enumerate program neighborhood. And lastly, down here, this is a change with MetaFrame Presentation Server 3. In the old days, zone data collectors used to transfer load information between zones. And that actually, if the zones were connected via a WAN link, could, could saturate WAN links with very large numbers of servers in each zone. And so the default configuration now, since uh, 
presentation server three is not to transfer that information across zones. If you've got high, um, high connections between or, or high speed connections between your zones, it's probably okay to share your load information, but it, it's defaulted to not sharing that load information across the zones. Again, you create those zones because they are in each, all the servers in that zone have high network connection to each other, but the connection between those servers and servers in a different zone may be a very latent connection or a slow network connection. So that's zones. And so the last thing I'm going to show you is the difference between what you're seeing here, which is the properties of the farm, and the properties of the individual servers. Now, see if I cl right click on one of the servers and choose properties, I see a lot of the same nodes that I see inside of the farm properties, but there's one major difference. You see this checkbox that says use farm settings for ICA Keep Alive? A lot of these configurations have the ability for you to say, I don't care what the individual server says, but whatever the farm says, that's what I want to be my configuration for this server. You'll see that for Keep Alive, you'll see that for ICA settings, you'll see that for, uh, for isolation settings. There are a number of these that have that checkbox capability. Now, now not all of them do, but uh, a number of them do. And the reason for this is because, for the most part, your settings for the farm are probably going to be reasonably close to what you want to your settings for the individual server. And once in a while, you're not going to want to have a particular server that has the same setting as the farm. And in that case, you unselect the checkbox and create an exception for that rule. But generally, you're probably going to keep whatever the farm setting is. It is worthwhile to note that uh, there are some settings in here that are not mirrored at the farm level. This one, for example, ICA printer bandwidth has the ability for you to configure how much bandwidth is available to the client, either unlimited or limited. This particular one is important because although the ICA protocol is a very tight protocol, it's very highly optimized for WAN connections, for latent connections. Anytime the, that the user at the other end of the wire clicks print or tries to copy a file down directly from server to client, that ICA protocol isn't really used anymore. It actually has to transfer data to get from the client to the server to do the print job. And in that case, sometimes the user can experience a loss in their user experience or a reduction in their user experience because it's trying to jam that print job up that very narrow ICA pipe. If you have situations where that's a problem, you can set this from unlimited to limited and give it an amount of kilobits per second. That's the maximum amount of bandwidth that those printer jobs can consume. This has the, uh, the also the effect of, re of increasing the amount of time it takes to complete a print job, sometimes substantially, depending on what you set the, uh, the bandwidth to. So it's a trade-off. Other settings in here that are not at the farm level are, for example, reboot schedule. You may want to reboot your servers at, at times, uh, once a week or once a day. This is done because some applications may have memory leaks or may just perform better if rebooted on a regular schedule. And this makes it very convenient to say, okay, once a week on Mondays, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and reboot those servers. So these are the configurations for per server. And again, the only time you ever want to configure these is when you want to do an exception between what this configuration is for the server and what the configuration is for the farm. So in this nugget, we've spent some time talking about Citrix licensing. We've gone to the mycitrix.com website, and we've punched in our license code and downloaded our license file. We've taken that license file and we've imported it into the Citrix license management console and configured licensing for our presentation server. We've also configured some farm settings. We've talked about the MetaFrame toolbar and what that allows us to do. Uh, and we've also gone into some great detail on the Citrix MetaFrame console, the CMC, and each the, of the configurations inside of the CMC, both at the farm level and at the server level. In the next section, we're going to talk about uh, policies and how we can use policies to um, configure these settings for a number of servers or a number of users, and also Citrix connection configuration for how we're going to control the ICA channel. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.